Old Red's itching to have a little fun. You remember Old Red? We did a frame repair on this a while back. Kind of quick and dirty. She been out in the woods. She been out in the landings. She been hauling logs. Hanging in there like a hair in a biscuit. My buddy Dalton sold these guys that bumper he couldn't use. So that thing, it's pretty, it's pretty mint on there. This is the kind of truck that bumper belongs on. Anyhow, no ways. Let's take a look, see what we got right here. We got crackulation. Crackulation and bustification. And it's worse over here. Gouge her out. Weld her up. This is a side with a little less cracking. Carbon arc gouge, I was on about 260 amps. Five sixteenths carbon rod and 80 PSI air. This is about a half inch plate. I was trying to dig in about three eighths. So, you know, we've left a little crack here to burn rod on. So let's do that. One pass of 532, uh, 530 seconds inch arc 80 pipe rod. And when I was running that, I was just kind of dancing down through that crack. Go to the other side here. One really important thing you got to remember working on something like this and welding that first pass in something like this. Right on the other side of the plate that I'm welding on is a part that uh you know it's right against this plate and the way this hinges this has to move freely uh we all want to get deep penetration but if you don't pay attention to what you're doing and you you gouge this out so much and weld in there so deep that you weld this piece to that piece uh man you'd have a major problem here if you did that um and and that's something that you know, a uh, a novice welder, uh, first time working on something like this, might accidentally do that. You've got, you know, we all want to get good penetration, but if you do something that causes this machine to completely not work, uh, that's no good. So, you know, I I dance down over that with that rod, and even though it would be virtually impossible to know exactly how much I've gouged in depth wise on every single part of it. What I can do is with experience as I dance down through there with that welding rod, I can get a feel for how soft, I'm gonna use the word soft, but I'm actually meaning thick or thin. I can get a feel for, uh, you know, based on the heat and how easy that metal melts, I can get a feel for whether or not it's so thin that I need to worry about burning through it. And if so, then I would not try to penetrate as much. I would just try and 
seal over it but now that I've got a pass in it now with this one well controlled downhill pass in it you know I I know I can take my my 7018 and really go in there and weld now so that's what I'm going to do the next pass over top of this downhill pipe rod the pass that I'm going to run now is going to be uphill and I'm going to go in and I'm going to uphill and I'm going to purify this with a 332nd 7018. But on this edge, I want to mention, up here on this edge, what I've done right here, I've took my 332 7018, even though, you know, I'm going to weld uphill. But even, even though I'm going to weld uphill, on an edge like this, I've taken my rod and started at the top and went ahead and done quite a bit of fill at the top of this. Now, if you think about how your uphill welding is going to go, then you realize how important it is to do this first when you're talking about an edge like this. It's real important because if I didn't build this up and I left this the way it was just a moment ago and I started here at the bottom and I was welding uphill and that heat that heat is is rising up into that steel by the time i got here to this upper edge this this material would be so hot that i would have a hard time i'd have a hard time getting this sealed getting that filled now that i've got a considerable amount of material right here and i've taken you can see where i've taken the grinder and kind of built me a ramp to come up into now that I've done that, I can start down here and weld right up into that. I know I've got some meat here. I've got some material here that'll hold that, hold that heat and hold that weld I'm about to make. The second pass, it's in there. 3 30 seconds inch, 7018. This is the second pass which is the, the first pass uphill and the first pass with a 7018. You'll notice on that one right there, and a lot of them, I didn't start all the way at the bottom. Well, remember the ends of this, I want it ramped. You know, I don't want the, uh, I don't want all, all of this depth at the end that I have in the middle I don't need that depth there as I start my next one I'll start a little lower and on the final one I'll probably start clear down here it's all part of how I'm going to proceed with filling that in let's go to the other side and take a look So where I'm at with that right now, I think as far as that being in there really deep, uh, it's not deep, super deep like it was. So I don't think I need the 332nd rod anymore. I'll go to 1 8th and I'll be able to carry a little bit more steel. You could do all of it, even that pass with the 1 8th, but if I was doing that, I probably would have gouged out a little bit more metal. Give myself a little bit more room for the bigger rod. If I was to mention something about this vertical welding with a 7018, it's so common for uh, novice welders when they get when they're getting started, they're gonna run their 7018 flat and, and horizontal, and they're and they're they got it going pretty good, and then they get to vertical and they just really struggle. Well, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about how heat rises. And I think the biggest reason people struggle is because they start welding. Kind of seems like everything's going okay. But that material is getting so hot so fast that it just gets too hot for them to burn one full rod. And make a decent looking weld and, and a weld that's under control. So, the biggest tip that I could give you, if you're at that point with your welding where you're welding flat good, you're welding horizontal pretty good, but you're really struggling with vertical, 
Well, then hear me on this. Welding vertical is when you really need to start focusing on your arc length. Because welding vertical is where you can't run the same arc length throughout an entire rod. Arc length is the distance from the tip of your rod to your molten puddle. And if that arc length is longer, it's hotter. If it's shorter, it's cooler. When you weld vertical, the way you need to look at it, your amperage on your machine should be set so that when you start welding, you have to long arc that rod to be hot enough. If you don't have to long arc it a little bit when you start welding, then your amperage is way too hot to burn that entire rod without getting the material too hot. So your machine should be set where you start out with a long arc and as you proceed, you're going to shorten your arc length. You're going to push the tip of that rod ever closer to your molten puddle. By the time you get to the end of that rod, by the time you, you know, you're about to finish using the rod you're burning, you're not only going to be cooling your puddle by maintaining a very short arc, you're also going to be cooling the puddle because your arc is so short that you're feeding cold steel rod into the puddle, which accelerates its cooling. If I would guess that if you've been struggling with vertical welding, no matter how many times you have to listen to what I just said, if you would listen to that and practice that, it'll help you. I really think it will. It, you know, if you're at that point, uh, that's going to be the key. Arc length is, is going to be the key that, that, that takes you... Uh, to the point where you really have control of your vertical weld. I'm going to get some other rods and turn my machine up and get back on this. Just running that third pass and using the, the 1 8 inch rod and uh, everything's good. I'm going to mention on this one right here, I started right there and I ran a bit of a stringer to about right here and started weaving. Uh, the, the reason that I didn't start down here and go is this had a low place there. And the sooner I start getting this even, if it's extra low, the better. I'm not going to wait to the next pass to do it. The way that I've filled this in a little here and then weaved it up through there, I've got it more even now. And now I'm going to start out down here and run one up. got that in there so that kind of makes it so that this has four passes in it while everything else has three doesn't matter and normally I don't even count the number of passes that I put in something like this uh, it's basically more paying attention to how filled it is and you know how much you're you want to put in there another thing I'm going to mention uh, about welding vertical since this is a good example right here uh, uh, this is a good example of a vertical weld that's not exactly vertical. Right now, if I was to hold my welding rod exactly vertical, you can see this weld is not exactly vertical. It's over here. Right there is about plumb. But, as I weld up through here, and this is a case with any vertical weld, if I'm moving... When I'm, when I'm making my motions, I've got to make these motions perfectly level. I want to be parallel with the horizon. In the case of, the, in the case of well, we're managing something that's a liquid. That puddle is, that weld puddle is like a, uh, it's, it's like lava. It's a liquid. But it solidifies as it's cooling. And in the case with vertical welding, we're pouring in a liquid uphill. And one could understand why that'd be kind of difficult to do. 
But why does it work? How does it work? How could we apply something that's a liquid to a surface that's plumb? Well, we're doing this by, by way of, as we weld, behind us, the material is cooling, and that's building us a bridge for our non-solid metal to rest on. That's the reason that it's critical if you're doing a weave with your 7018. Your motion, I'm going to exaggerate here, your motion must be level, parallel with the horizon. If you were to move like this, moving in the same angle as this, uh, as this, you know, 90 degrees from this non plumb surface, then over here on the lower side, you're going to have major sags. I call them gonzos when you got a a, a booger of, of material that go goobers out on you. I call it a gonzo. Uh, you're going to have that really bad because you're you're going to be making a motion that does not put that solid that solid material level underneath of you. You got to have that solid cooled material level underneath of you. So as this liquid tries to fall, it's caught by the solid material. Quick note on that, and I'm, I'm going back to work on this. So now with that pass in there, we're flush. Pretty much, uh, you know, getting close to being full to the, to the surface of the plate. We'll go to this other side. So the next thing now is I would start to add, I guess, what you would call the reinforcement. Uh, we're going to be putting some weld on here that's actually more than the surface, more than just the surface extra, you know, uh, some, some reinforcement material. And I'm going to do that now. Okay, this is done. I've got the... The reinforcement there, the cap added on. I've said before, whenever, whenever you have cracking like this it's pretty common I think that you would get metal fatigue in the area uh, beside the, the crack so I don't think there's anything wrong on a repair like this there's I don't think there's anything wrong with going a little heavy on your on your reinforcement uh, where you're adding your final weld and to that to that idea or that thought i guess you'd probably run into a lot of people you might run into a lot of people that would bring up the idea of actually plating that you know uh they would say well you fixed the crack but you know why don't you Put, why don't you weld a plate over that and make sure it doesn't happen again? Well, the repair that I just made there, I feel completely confident it's going to outlast the rest of what's in that area. And if you t look at what's in that area, you know, there's a bushing right there. If I was to plate over that when we had a crack that close to that bushing, I would have to weld inside of the hole that I make around the plate around that bushing. And then it, if I did that and then that bushing went bad and, and the customer needed me to cut the bushing out and replace it, that would be a nightmare to cut out of there. 
I mean, that bushing would be welded to the plate it's welded to now, plus a plate over top of it welded. Man, I don't know. I, I don't think that would be the right thing to do. Uh, considering that I believe that what I just did without any plating is probably going to offer the kind of lifespan that, that exceeds what's there. Uh, I really think that it would be a bad idea, or at least if it's not a bad idea, it's at least unnecessary to plate that. So that's it for that. Y'all have a good one.